Um, hi, really happy to be here and uh, happy that we get to have this nice little like philosophical discussion um, about using machine learning to evaluate grants. So uh, as, oh, and this is uh, joint work with Liam Kofi Bright, um, who couldn't be here, but all of the bad things in the talk are his fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he would say if, if he was here. I actually don't agree. <laughs> um, okay, so using machine learning to evaluate science. So uh, as our previous speaker did a much better job explaining, um, there are lots of roles that are being proposed for machine learning in science. Um, a lot of them are coming out of this kind of science of science research, research initiative, which for us philosophers of science is a little bit surreal sometimes. Uh, it's an effort by scientists primarily to uh, use uh, various tools, including conceptual analysis and also uh, some statistical or empirical techniques to study science, investigate its methodology, uh, things that philosophers of science might have thought they'd been doing for a couple centuries, but uh, it is also now being done in this or science of science or meta science community. Um, there's also a lot of interest from uh, funding agencies in the US. This was sort of started by DARPA, but by no means limited to DARPA. Uh, and, and I think that interest um, has now spread. Ooh. Have to be perfectly positioned between these microphones, uh, has now spread to more funding agencies. Okay, so what are some of the things that uh, we're trying to predict? Well, uh, we're trying to predict the success of groups, as was mentioned. We're trying to predict uh, the success of individual researchers. So, can we, um, in this sort of uh, inflammatorily named paper, can we do money ball for professors? Can we figure out which, you know, professors are going to have a great research impact in their early career and sort of bet on them in a certain way? Uh, should that be used to um, influence tenure decisions or NSF career awards? So these kinds of metrics are often proposed as a substitute for other numbers like H index or something. <laughs> um, or we could evaluate researchers just in terms of their sort of like past history. And uh, we could try to predict which researchers are gonna win awards in the future. Uh, we could rank conferences or journals in a way that sort of uh, tries to bypass just the citation metrics. Um, or we could do something more sort of qualitative in character says, hey, we have certain national research goals, for example, that we said that our funding is going to be based on. Um, let's do some kind of topic modeling or text analysis to try to figure out to what extent do these projects that have been submitted for this grant scheme align with those goals. Uh, so we could do sort of a matching or pairing exercise. And then, of course, uh, we can uh, use machine learning to try to allocate or influence the distribution of grant funding. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. <laughs> and this is um, work that's also trying to respond to concerns about the current state of grant allocation and peer review. So uh, as Emily mentioned, there's this concern about time spent by researchers to write grants, um, most of which are not funded. So it seems like a tremendous tax or waste, all this researcher energy goes into writing these documents uh, that may have some value in clarifying their own ideas or their own research projects, but surely that value could have been achieved in a less roundabout way. Um, then, of course, researchers also have to review the grants. Um, we have to create this whole infrastructure to administer the reviewing of grants. Um, there's this worry that reviewing might be biased in various ways, um, and as a result of that, underrepresented researchers might strategically spend even more time preparing their grants so that they're less likely to be rejected, uh, so there might be a differential tax, potentially, and there's also inconsistency. So 
I think this research is very interesting. Uh, not only do you often have low agreement among reviewer scores on the same panel, uh, if you give the same grant with certain you know, proper nouns changed to the same panel months later, they will give it a different score. So it seems like there isn't even, you know, uh, within the same group of individuals, even if we want to say the panel as a whole is making the decision, it's fine that individuals disagree, um, that same sort of group entity isn't consistent over time. So we have these kind of uh, resource-based worries about time, attention, energy, and we also have these epistemic worries, like is this evaluation process really getting at the right thing? So um, I'm just gonna completely bypass uh, a lot of the interesting ideas that were just raised in the previous talk about whether or not uh, we should think that this is going to work. And I'm just gonna say for the space of this uh, analysis, let's just consider what if it did work? So as Mel was saying, what if um, this machine learning based evaluation of grants <clears throat> did get at whatever good making properties we wanted to uh, discern in the grant review process. And I'm gonna suggest even if it did work in this sense, there's still an epistemic worry that we should have. And so I'm gonna be contrasting, broadly speaking, uh, the value of epistemic diversity in science and the role of machine learning as a standardizing influence on these judgment outcomes with these known concerns that I just outlined about peer review by humans. Okay, so, uh, the central pillar of things that we're going to care about on one side are these known benefits of epistemic diversity in science. So what does epistemic diversity do for us? One, it helps us cover logical space. So scientific inquiry requires exploring many possibilities, uh, many of which might be or seem to be antecedently unlikely. And certainly at any given time slice, it requires that we explore possibilities that are not in what we might call the dominant sort of Kuhnian paradigm of the time. And so from the point of view of uh, the mainstream of researchers or even the main two or three stream of researchers, uh, there's a long-term value to science of exploring ideas that are outside of those dominant research paradigms. And we think we're very likely to miss out on fruitful theories if we don't do this. So there's been a lot of interesting research uh, about how the incentives of scientific institutions can either encourage or discourage this exploration. So this is something uh, where people often talk about citation networks in this context. So one of the nice things about being within the Kuhnian paradigm, within the mainstream, is that you have a lot of people who are going to cite you, or at least have the potential to cite you, because they're doing the same kind of thing, they're relying on methodologies that you've established, they're building on your work, they're disagreeing with your work, but sort of from an own team type way, where they're going to engage heavily with it. Whereas uh, the kind of researchers that are outside of this paradigm might not be really citable by researchers in the mainstream who form the majority. So you might think, um, that uh, a lot of guides that we typically use for reasonable reasons, like citations, to express how much interest there is in this work at a particular you know, early stage, stage time slice are going to miss the interest of these novel exploratory paradigmatic um, research. We can also think about epistemic diversity as something that helps us ensure against error. So when we think about evidence gathering as a time extended activity, there's no guarantee that the first evidence that we get is going to lead us towards the path that will help us gather the right kind of evidence in the future, or even that the first evidence that we get will be representative of the evidence that we go on to later gather. So, um, if we sort of over-index on the first evidence that we get uh, and establish some sort of uh, model or theory on that basis, um, it might be that we need these kind of epistemic diversity exploratory approaches in order to develop whatever will come 
next. So it might be that the, the next theory will require uh, combining tools that cut across disciplinary boundaries. Maybe that's sort of like resource intensive for a variety of ways. Maybe it just takes longer. Um, or a field might be stuck in a failed approach. We can all think of examples within our subfields of sciences where this happens. Um, and finally, we might think that epistemic diversity is valuable for getting things right, however we want to cash that out. And I don't think we have to be excessively realist about this to think that there's some value in having a variety of approaches that provide a variety of evidence or confirmatory support. So if you think things like methodological triangulation could be valuable, we have multiple methodologies uh, in the mix. Um, we might want to lean into sort of the uncertainty of letting uh, maybe not a thousand, but at least you know a hundred or a dozen flowers bloom for some amount of time and pursue a variety of different approaches and see what they can gather on an evidential basis. Okay, so now that we've motivated at least some reasons to think that epistemic diversity in science is valuable, let's think about how that might uh, have an interplay with a predictive machine learning model that we're trying to use to evaluate scientific projects. So I'm gonna go through a series of sort of levels of strength of our predictive model. And sometimes in the more theoretical computer science, uh, we use an oracle to talk about this. So this is sort of a, an, an highly idealized uh, idea that we could have some kind of figure that would just like tell us all and only the right answers. So imagine if our predictive model had this character. If it was an oracle that it could just perfectly identify all and only good science, you know, if the hand of God reaches down and just touches all of the grant proposals that are good, um, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. That sounds great. Uh, so, you know, if the heavens open up and tell you which projects are good, fantastic. Uh, I don't think any of us think that our machine learning model is going to be at that level of success. So let's move on. Now imagine our oracle identifies 90% good, fruitful uh, scientific projects, and 10% it just sort of draws randomly from the distribution. I think this is also great uh, for reasons that I will go on to mention. But I think uh, the case that we're actually much more likely to be in is the case where we have these multiple predictive oracles, we have these multiple models, each identifies, you know, some percent, whether it's 90 or less, of good scientific projects, but makes errors on not projects drawn randomly from the distribution, but on the same y percent of projects, or uh, the same kinds of projects. So these errors are correlated. And that's what I want to focus on in the next part of the talk, is why do we think that these errors that different predictive models make when trying to identify good grants are likely to be correlated. So um, why I think that multiple oracles with correlated errors is the closest realistic analog for algorithmic ranking grants. The first one is this tradition of component sharing within machine learning. Yeah. So component sharing within machine learning is uh, an epistemic good, an epistemic success story. So at any given time, there will be very good data sets, very good models, good libraries, good evaluations, and people are right to flock to those best current available tools. Uh, but what this means is that you see a strong pattern of herding at any given time slice. So for example, consider the ImageNet uh, data set. So this was one of the first very large uh, labeled image data sets. So it was a bunch of images that were labeled with what was in those images sort of as, as the focal uh, part of the focal figure in the image. And because a lot of people wanted to be able to do supervised learning, so they needed some kind of label such that when the model guessed, the, the label can be used to say, no, 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 uh, that's not right. Um, we need this label to be supervised 
but creating a legal data set is very expensive. So for a long time, ImageNet was sort of the game in town, and most people trained on that. Likewise, there was a time period when BERT was one of the largest uh, language-related models, and so 83% of papers in computational linguistics used exactly BERT. Um, so we have these uh, time step related patterns where everyone flocks to the best tools in town. And just as a sort of illustrative example, when a lot of people are using ImageNet, they also tend to have standardized errors. So ImageNet related errors are over-reliance on the same spurious cues or shortcuts like background textures to predict the foreground options. So here in this image um, on the left, you have what's supposed to be a fox squirrel, uh, the little creature. Um, but most models will say with high probability that it's a sea lion. On the right, you have a dragonfly, but most models will say it's a manhole cover. So why is that? It's because uh, the texture of the sort of background objects is very strong. And so the sea lion has kind of this wet skin that's similar to the wet rock. Uh, the manhole cover has this cross hatching that's similar to the icing lawn chair or whatever that is. Uh, and so because the model has learned to use background textures to predict these objects, it gets these consistently wrong. But what's important is not that these models make mistakes. Of course they make mistakes. It's that they make the same mistakes. So uh, relying on the same data sets and standardize these errors. And we see this also in large language models. So because of the scope and scale of data that large language models require, uh, they require things like a crawl of the entire internet. Well, we, we can do slightly different crawls of the entire internet, but we only have one entire internet. Uh, we can't come up with a different one in order to have a different data set. And similarly, when you look at uh, papers that are attempting to do uh, prediction about scientific projects, they often, although not always, rely on the same two uh, attempts to gather all scientific papers and their citation network of each other. So we have Scopus and we have Web of Science. But similarly, even though these have slightly different properties, the attempt to gather all scientific papers and all of their citations of each other should, if done correctly, eventually result in a very similar data set. Um, so you're training on this past history, and both of these data sets can propagate uh, downstream to the projects that train on those data sets. Um, we can also see this in the projects that uh, try to do some kind of like more rich text analysis of the grant text itself, often using large language models. Um, there, when we're thinking about various kinds of larger foundation models, you have this concern that adopting the same foundation model for a bunch of different tasks can has this potential to create a single point of failure. Um, so with some co-authors, we try to uh, systematize this and show to what extent do we think this is a problem in the current ecosystem. Um, so if you imagine this uh, process where we go from data creation to curation to training to adaptation of a model to deployment of that model. Um, you can think about different pathways in that process. So the sort of canonical pathway on the upper left would be, we have some kind of data set, that's the orange. We go to some kind of model, that's the blue. Uh, and then we adapt it for some downstream purpose, that's the red. But of course, we can also imagine a case where we're starting with an existing model uh, on the upper left, we bring in a second data set and we use that to adapt the model. Or we can imagine a case where different applications depend on each other in the way that many applications depend on GPT-4. And so if we try to, try to create a giant graph of all these dependencies, we can see that there are clear hubs. And these hubs are could be data set hubs. So if there's a really clean, good data set like the pile, uh, where people have tried to uh, strip out the nastiness that's in the entire internet, uh, a lot of different models will use that data set. And again, for good reasons. 
or you can see a model hub where a lot of different models will rely on one Bates model or an API hub. So this is uh, a graph of just a small subset of all the things that we end on ChatGPT's API. Um, and a lot of these are consumer products that we probably interact with. So Microsoft products, but also Slack products, but also uh, Snapchat or Spotify or Instacart. And there wouldn't be a way from the consumer facing side to know that all of these share this dependency. And so these kind of hubs are a form of algorithmic monoculture, where the properties of one model flow downstream to a lot of different things that are trained on it. Oh, I'll, I'll put it back. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so what is an algorithmic monoculture? Well, just as uh, an agricultural monoculture has these sort of known pros and cons, uh, the pros are mostly in the short term. In the short term, it's easier to plant just one crop across acres and acres. In the short term, it's easier to fertilize just one crop. It's easier to harvest just one crop. Um, it's easier to set up a distribution network to sell that just one crop. But in the medium term, uh, it has the potential to de degrade the quality of the soil as that initial crop strips out all the nutrients uh, and makes it such that planting that same crop over and over uh, could lead to a collapse in the soil health of that field. Um, we're going to think about algorithmic monoculture as something that's often, you know, epistemically good in the short term, but less epistemically good in the medium term. So Feinberg and Raghavan define algorithmic monoculture at the state in which many decision makers rely on the same algorithm. So in the UK context, tell me if you think this is accurate. I tried to look this up uh, a couple of nights ago. Um, you can imagine a case where uh, SDXC builds a grant screening algorithm. They use it on all their projects um, and they share it with other agencies like MRC and EPRC. Okay, but that's not that realistic because uh, those are completely different kinds of scientific activities. So we wanna relax uh, this definition of monoculture and think instead about cases where many decision makers rely on similar algorithms. So it's more realistic to imagine that each of these agencies will build their own grant screening algorithm, but they will all rely on Scopus data and they might even all rely on a similar best in class mm -hmm. learning algorithm. And so what we're worried about in terms of encouraging epistemic diversity in the field of science is cases where uh, if researchers are applying to multiple grant schemes, uh, cases where they are denied by all of them. So we're going to call that a systemic failure. So in the second row, it's uh, the row of X's. Um, because in all the other cases, they're getting at least one grant. And so they're able to continue their scientific activity. And so this algorithmic monoculture culture can lead to a homogenization of outcomes where uh, each decision maker is deciding separately, but using similar models, and the decisions are highly correlated, such that the decision makers make the same errors. And if we want to measure this, we can measure this by saying uh, a grant applicant will experience systemic failure if every decision-making system misclassifies their application. So um, in a different past work, uh, we tried to formalize this, and what we wanted to say here was, look, if we just sort of count the number of systemic failures as a way to measure uh, the amount of outcomes of optimization, we're going to over-index on the extent to which each of these classifiers is bad. Uh, so we're going to over-index on the error rate. Because you can imagine in the extreme case, if each of the classifiers is just terrible and they only classify 20% of things correctly, of course, there's going to be a lot of collision of errors, but it's just because there are so many errors. So we need to normalize by the error rate and normalize by sort of what would we have expected the rate of systemic failure to be based on the error rate. Okay, so the problem situation so far is that data and algorithm sh sharing has the potential to lead to an algorithmic monoculture that leads itself to correlated decisions. And these correlated decisions make systemic failures where people are failed by all grant agencies more likely. 
So we've established this measure that can help us figure out how much more likely systemic failures are than we would expect, and therefore how correlated are these decision makers. Systemic failures are the most consequential because then the teams receive no funding. And so if grant making agencies consistently define the same kinds of research, the potential, there are potential consequences for the epistemic diversity of science. Okay, so what should we do? So I have three different proposals and I'll tell you which one I like and I'll tell you which one Liam likes and then you guys can tell me which one you like. Okay, so the first one, this is my favorite is can we, um, even within one agency or even within one grant scheme, create diverse models? So uh, can we have um, multiple uh, groups or perhaps assessors who adopt significantly different assessments of quality or pursuit worthiness or significantly different ways to measure the goodness of these different projects based on different and kind criteria? Um, and under the hopes that that will naturally generate diverse outcomes. And then of course, if we just sort of deterministically combine these, we haven't actually created the kind of diversity we would hope. We have created a different single model that then has a mixed basis of criteria. So instead of deterministically combining them, what we wanna do is keep those models in play and for different, uh, grant schemes or grant applications or instances or cycles uh, use different models to produce the outputs. So that the same research group applying with the same project to different grant schemes that uses this uh, mixed algorithm could have the option of getting different results. So one way to do this would be to rely on sort of the predictive multiplicity that exists within the creation of machine learning models. We can always create more models that have different outputs, constrain them to be different from each other. Sometimes when we do this, we then <coughs> ensemble them. So we create them uh, in a way that we are intending them to feed back into the same single model, but we don't have to. We can instead choose between them for any token decision instance. Um, some of my collaborators uh, looked at everything I just said and said, that's nice, but ultimately we could get the same thing by just establishing a more complex um, single algorithm and then uh, deter and then uh, choosing from that distribution and flipping a coin to determine variants of those points. So what we could do is we have one single model and then that model itself has certain points that it's more or less certain about. Certainly you could imagine uh, if we have some kind of threshold there are many points for which the model would be uncertain. Should this be at a 49% or 51%? I That's well within my error bars, as it were. So we can use conformal prediction to identify the points about which the model is most uncertain, and then we can flip those in different uh, instances of this grant scheme. And the nice thing about that is depending on how big of a threshold we choose, we don't lose a lot of accuracy, but we do get improvements in outcome context. Okay, and finally, Liam's favorite, uh, we can randomize above some kind of threshold entirely. So we can just say, okay, there's some buckets, <clears throat> there's some grants that are obviously feasible in some way. We're not even gonna order those. We're just gonna say, these are all seem like this group could probably do them to some level of quality. Uh, we set a threshold and then we just randomly select from that pool. And so this kind of lottery based approach uh, obviously is much simpler and doesn't require the predictive ranking at all. Um, there's some question for all of these, of course, about the normative, epistemic normative status of these kind of mixed strategy methods where we're saying, in some sense, we have some ability to uh, predict what's good, but we're not going to use our full capacity to do that. Instead, we're going to inject randomness. So I think with all three of those methods, you might have this question. But I think that kind of departure from your full ability to satisfy your preferences in the short term based on what you know is worth it given the potential cost to epistemic diversity of sticking too closely 
to your initial ranking. So the hope is that the adoption of these algorithmic tools will um, blunt the effects of the standardization that we think is very likely. Uh, so given the known benefits of the pursuit of epistemic diversity in science, we recommend that the decision makers adopt a strategy that includes some element of randomness. And so in that spirit, we've offered these three ideas. In conclusion, <laughs> we do not use correlated machine learning to evaluate grants. Only God knows what science is now. Thank you.